welcome. Uh, my name's Leanne Hartle. I'm the uh, representative to the UN for IP2, and it's my pleasure to be able to moderate this esteemed panel this afternoon. Um, I guess my job, just briefly, in terms of representing IP2, is to facilitate participation for major groups and other stakeholders in UN activities, programs, um, presenting papers, presentations around the Sustainable Development Goals and the review of those goals annually at the High Level Political Forum in New York. So it's really opened up opportunities to not only um, meet a whole range of global entities, but also to promote the work of IP2 and to, to learn a lot about the uh, UN. I'm not even going to begin to try and explain that. I've got uh, Ali and Hitomi who might be able to do that. A very complex system that's very difficult to navigate, uh, particularly for people who uh, have English as a second language or other um, barriers to participation. So I'm one of uh, three global organising partners for the NGO, the non-government organisation's major group to help facilitate that participation. So in a, in a nutshell, that's, that's my role as the UN representative. I'm happy to discuss that in lots more detail and a lot more things to tell you about. But I think onto the, the panel now. So um, the process will be that each of the panel members will speak for about five minutes. We really want to do the Q&A and give people the opportunity to ask uh, more in-depth questions of our panel members. They've all struggled to kind of fit what they want to say into five minutes because they all have so much uh, wealth of information to share with us. So I'm going to keep you to time and please don't get cross when I cut you off. But I know there's going to be a lot of questions um, in relation to, to the words that you're going to share with us. So I'll begin by uh, introducing Hitomi Rankin, the uh, Environmental Affairs Officer with the Environment Development Division of, and you might have heard UN SCAP. SCAP is the um, Economic and Social Commission of the Asia Pacific. Um, and Hitomi's been working with the United Nations in the area of sustainable development for about 15 years in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Asia and the Pacific. Her most recent work has focused on the greening of economic growth and participation of stakeholders and public in implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. She works closely with civil society and has been our um, contact our primary contact person into the UN in the Asia-Pacific region has worked closely with IP2. Um, the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, or ESCAP, has a membership of 53 countries that span from Turkey in the west to Samoa in the east, and ESCAP is one of the five commissions of the UN that delivers on the UN economic and social mandate, supporting cooperation between governments. So please welcome Hitomi. So hello everyone and thanks very much Leanne. I also want to thank the board for inviting ESCAP here to talk about the partnership and the work that we've been doing together and um, I'm happy to do that because it's been a really, really good journey with IP2 and it's been very important work with really good impact. So um, Leanne explained what we do, who we are, so I won't do that again. But just to talk about the 2015 agenda very, very briefly, does anybody know what the SDGs are and the 2015 agenda. Well, not that many people. We're not doing a good job. Okay. So the 2030 agenda is an agreement between all the member states of the UN around what we want the future to look like in, the tw in 2030, in the year 2030. And towards that, the governments agreed on 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And I think the key things about this framework of goals is that they're totally interlinked. So if you can imagine, it's really difficult to delink decent work, goals like decent work and economic growth from sustainable cities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are very linked goals. And the other thing about the 2030 agenda, it emphasizes that we cannot leave anyone behind, right? So really, this is what the UN is about, focusing on the vulnerable and the marginalized people. And at the same time, it realizes that the progress for these groups depends on all countries pulling together. So it's a universal agenda. So in the past, these kinds of agendas have been thought to be applied only to developing countries, but no, this is a, uh, a universal agenda for all countries. And the other thing about these goals is that by, looking at the, by focusing on integration of the goals, it's recognizing that we're living in a complex world and we cannot take a siloed approach anymore. 
and that's what the 2030 Agenda tries to emphasize. And it really asks us to transform the way that we work and the things that we do in a really short space of time. So it's very ambitious, right? Now, what was good about this is that there was unprecedented effort by the UN to bring stakeholders together to develop all of these goals. So behind this, this framework of, in, of uh, goals, there's a set of indicators. And there are over 200, 273 indicators which support each of these goals, right, as a group. So this is a massive task, a lot of monitoring, a lot of, a lot of work to be done, okay? So what happens next, right? So we have all of the governments getting together to talk about how to move forward on the agenda, but we also have an, an attempt at an accountability framework and a monitoring and evaluation framework. And there are three levels of, of, of monitoring and evaluation or follow-up and review, as we call it, right? So at the first level, it's really looking at what happens and what's the progress at the national level. And this is where governments integrate the SDGs and their indicators into their planning frameworks. And this is a big uh, effort for the governments, if you can imagine. Most of the data is missing. And uh, the second thing is that they do is that they prepare voluntarily uh, reports. And they present these reports to the region, to Asia and the Pacific, and they also present these reports at the global level to the high-level political forum on sustainable development, which meets once a year and which Michelle, in her role, is supporting as one of uh, as representative stakeholders there. So, these national reports are produced by countries, and they are supposed to be participatory in their preparation. So, New Zealand has produced one this year. Australia did it last year. So in fact, if it was a fully inclusive process, it would have been really important that many of you were involved in the process. And this is an issue that we can talk about a little bit more. And at the regional level, this is at the Asia Pacific level, we get the countries together to peer review what they've done so far on the SDGs and to learn from each other. And we do that at a very big meeting that happens every year as well. IEP2 has been there for at least two meetings, maybe three meetings, right? And, um, and it's a, it's a very multi-stakeholder uh, space where stakeholders get together with the governments and it's one of the few spaces where we can manage that um, and still have the intergovernmental character. And this is where we see a big shift in the way that the UN is doing business. And uh, so, so we have the three levels of follow-up and review. Okay. Uh, what's the progress so far? And this is some of the work that um, ESCAP focuses on, trying to look at what's the progress ar around the region. This is the kind of uh, reporting that we do, and it just helps to show the countries exactly where we're falling, to, falling behind or getting ahead in terms of progressing. Now, the issue with this kind of uh, graph is that it communicates well, but is it really representing the progress? Because very often when we do the report again next year, it looks a bit different because the data that we have is different, it's updated. Maybe it wasn't accurate, maybe the indicators change. But then also, we don't really know what's behind the indicators unless we talk to people, right? So this is the important aspect of follow-up and review, and this is why participation is so important. Okay, so with IP2, uh, SCAP, decided that we needed to really strengthen the response around engaging people in the 2030 agenda. So in uh, 2015, we had some internal capacity building around how we, we as an institution engage with stakeholders. And this is where I first met Joel, right? And then we started to think about what's the possibility for bringing institutions together who know something about engagement in a professional sense. And this is where the partnership became really important to, to, to how we engage. And through the board, which is very supportive, um, there was a team of experts who were put together, and we brought this team together to go to different countries. So we supported the national progress reporting that was done in a few countries, countries like Sri Lanka, Laos, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and, and a few others. And um, there was a team, so there was Martin, Michelle, uh, Chris, yeah, Helen, yeah, of course, Joel. Uh, who, were, who were brought together. And then we worked really strongly with Aldi as IP to Indonesia to make sure that uh, Indonesian government was also talking about participation and engagement. Okay. So 
We've been having a really good experience. There are lots of observations from that, which we can talk about a little bit more in this session, because we have to think about what next. Yeah, There's been a lot of demand, a lot of interest, but can we really meet this demand is a big question for us right now. Okay. One of the big efforts that we, we made uh, together with IP2, and IP2 actually invested in this, we co-invested in doing this, is to put together an indicator framework on meaningful participation. And Leanne would tell you that this has been the biggest, maybe the biggest piece of feedback from stakeholders is that they're not satisfied with the level of engagement because expectations were raised when we put the indicator framework together and we haven't met those expectations in terms of the quality of engagement that we're inviting stakeholders to. We have this issue of one-off consultation, people not being included, short times, not enough information, some really, really basic practice issues. And this is in addition to all of the systemic issues and the context issues that countries have to deal with already. So if you can imagine, there's a lot of unsatisfied uh, sat dissatisfaction around uh, different spaces in different countries. And what they were looking for, what governments were looking for was a set of indicators that would tell them really quickly where they're falling down in terms of their quality. Um, their quality. So uh, we, we, with stakeholders, defined uh, four dimensions of, of uh, quality engagement. And um, we put together also an indicator framework, and this was drawn from professional practice and aligned with the core values, IP2 core values and the quality assurance framework. So we have really good alignment there, but we did some really important testing with stakeholders. And I remember one session in Fiji where we sat with civil society and we went through the indicator framework with a fine tooth comb and Chris helped us with that work. And this is where we got to a space where we are really comfortable with the framework. Um, and it has also facilitated conversations with the government, for example, in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, around the kind of engagement or the levels of engagement that they would like to see within their, within their uh, spaces. So we see the tool as really, really um, important piece of work that's come out. We're going to have the tool launched after the conference, and we'll have a few copies of the short version outside. Okay. And I think that's it for me. All right, my, maybe the last point would be that one of the things that we have to do as, as, um, as, as SCAP is really do a lot of advocacy and bringing people together around the help desk and making information available. So we do have a help desk. There's a community of practice, including one around engagement, but lots of resources. It's really a treasure trove, um, which is going to be uh, translated into Russian and made available uh, through links with other global regions. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Hitomi. Our next speaker is Ellie Davidson, the Indigenous Engagement Leader from GHD. Ellie has been leading the Indigenous Engagement business at GHD, building on her skills as a town planner and consultation specialist. She's highly skilled in building rapport and relationships quickly and brings cultural sensitivity through her Aboriginal heritage. Ellie has worked across a range of projects in developing strategies and approaches to Indigenous engagement, particularly in the area of cultural celebration in the built form. Ellie has also been on the IP2 conference working group to help shape the program and incorporate more First Nations references. She is very passionate about providing a respectful platform for dialogue and supporting individuals to take their next step towards a more united Australia. Please welcome Ellie. Thank you very much. Um, this is on? Good. Um, so I've got five minutes allocated to me and I usually like to have a bit of a yarn. So I um, brought my phone up because what I wanted to do was to uh, link and align some stats around Aboriginal Australia and the Sustainable Development Goals. I think that with these types of programs and with um, a, a, you know, a global approach to these types of issues, it's kind of easy to overlook Australia as um, a place that these would apply or something that's relevant to this country. Um, and I've got some things here to share. Um, some of them might shock you, some of them you might have heard before, but I think it goes to highlight the importance of um, including and understanding uh, First Nations people when we as a, as a nation consider um, the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm just going to race right through them. I've got something aligned with each of the 17 goals. So no poverty. 
the rate of poverty is higher amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So it's 19.3% compared to 12.4% of the total Australian population. Zero hunger. More than one in five Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live in a household that had run out of food and were unable to buy more. Good health and well-being. The life expectancy gap between Indigenous males and non-Indigenous males is 8.6 years, uh, compared to 7.8 years for females. Quality education. Only 71% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attained at least a year 10 or basic vocational qualifications, compared to 92%. They were also over four times less likely to attain a bachelor degree or higher, 24% compared to 5%. Gender equality. Um, so this one probably doesn't really apply um, uh, because there's usually more female um, leaders in community. So maybe it's the gender balance on, on the reverse there. Um, clean water and sanitation. In remote communities, 28% of people living in a dwelling in which one or more of the facilities for washing people, clothes and bedding, for safely removing waste and or for enabling the safe storage and cooking of food were not available or did not work. So that's 28% of households. Affordable and clean energy. In some communities, electricity bills are over $3,000 per quarter decent work and economic growth. Non-Indigenous people in 2016 were 1.4 times more likely than Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be employed. Industry and innovation, in, innovation and infrastructure. One third of dwellings in remote communities needed repair or replacement. Reduced inequalities. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were far more likely to have been reported to child protection services, 5.1 times as likely, investigated by child protection, 6.3 times as likely, and placed into out-of-home care, 9.8 times as likely than non-Indigenous children. Sustainable cities and communities. Many communities rely on expensive, emissions-intensive diesel-powered generators to meet their electricity demands. Responsible consumption and production. Most remote communities continue to struggle to reliably collect and sustain domestic waste management systems. 13, climate action. By 2070, Central Australia will experience six months a year of above 35 degree temperatures, more intense rain, a greater number of extinctions of our unique wildlife and consequences on health, morale and our way of life in general, all due to climate change. Life below the water. For the past two decades, Aboriginal people have been lobbying for an environmental, social, economic and cultural share in the water market, but with little success. Life on the land. Overgrazing is one of the main pressures on biodiversity in Australia. 16. Peace, justice and strong institutions. Since 1989, the imprisonment rate of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people has increased 12 times faster than the rate of non-Aboriginal people. And the last one, partnerships for the goals. On my own country, uh, in the East Kimberley, the government spent several million dollars removing all the buildings from a community that my family wanted retained. They'd spent up to a billion dollars on that community. So it's pretty intense <laughs> um, and I don't necessarily mean that um, to, you know, be, you know, jarring or, um, you know, I don't want there to be, to, for us to walk away with a sense of heaviness, although the reality is it is pretty heavy. Um, but I think it just goes to show that, um, you know, being aware of these things and being aware of the differences in terms of access to all of the things that the sustainable development goals are about um, is, is something that we need to be mindful of as engagement practitioners. Um, you know, if we're really going to help um, empower our governments to meet these goals, 
roles, then us as a practitioner need to be um, more informed about Aboriginal engagement, how to engage with the community about these topics and to feel comfortable going in and engaging in a culturally sensitive way and in a respectful way. Um, so I suppose that, you know, out of this and out of the impact that these kind of stats can have, I just, um, I suppose, encourage people to take their next step in terms of understanding more about culture, trying to get involved in projects that relate to Aboriginal people and um, just put your hand up and learn because it's amazing how a couple of experiences can really help to build momentum and confidence in yourself um, and will help us as a, as a practitioner and as an industry to um, empower governments to understand the impacts of these things on Aboriginal people. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Some, some disappointing statistics there, but a great quick lesson what the SDGs all are. So thank you for that. Our next speaker is um, Arapata Rubin. Arapata is the chair of Tinai Tohu Riri Runanga, one of the five sub-tribes of Naitahu. This legal entity is one of 18 that make up Te Runung O Naitahu, which is the body corporate. Arapata's Fano have lived on Maori Reserve 873 for many generations and are still living there today. Please welcome Arapata. Fakapurkina uh, Tatato, Tatato Ute Matodong or Nafakaru, Heri Aiki Tatangi or Tipipi Fororo. Kui, kui, fiti fiti ora. E na mihi nui ki te atua, ko te e te timatana, ko te e te whakamutana, nā na nei nā mea katoa. Uh, ki nā mati, ki o rātou, ki o hari, ki tū o te arai, uh, tēnei te mihi, tēnei te tangi, uh, tēnei te poropora aki ki a rātou. Uh, moi mai, moi mai, moi mai rā. Uh, tā nei whakapiripiri e tū nei, e kohi nei e nā tangata, a uh, te nākoe e whakamaru nei tātou e tēnei wā. Ke te manu o tēnei whenua, nga maunga whakahi, nga awa, nga moana, e reriana, nga tohu o te whenua, e whakamuru nei mātou mō nga Bujigal uh, Nation, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. E nga aunties, nga māngai o te kōrero, te taumata o te kōrehi a tamawahine, uh, tēnā koe, tēnā kōrua. Uh, ki nga... Uh, ko tu manako he maha kapotu i tēnei wā, e tika ana ki mihi atu, ki mihi mai, e tika ana ki te kōrero o nga tātou tūpuna. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou koutou. So firstly, I'd just like to thank, give praise to our Lord above, to those that have passed on before us, to this whare that protects us over these coming days, and also to the haukainga that have supported us here today. Unfortunately, the aunties are not here. Um, also, sorry, I've forgotten the bio, uh, the four most important things. I'm a grandson, a son, a husband, and a father. Those are the most important things. So, just quickly, you're going to get a five-minute speed date here on engagement and non-engagement with um, Naitahu, Naitahu, Hurere Māori. Our first formal engagement was 1840, where we signed the Treaty of Waitangi. The three key important things from that were that the white skin be treated equal as the brown. That the laws protected Māori, and it also gave the Crown the opportunity to buy Māori land. In 1844, the Crown entered into negotiations to buy land from Naitahu Māori in Dunedin. They not only bought the land, but they bought the stones below the land, the minerals, and the water. So in 1844, Crown acknowledged an Indigenous culture as not only being landowners, but the soil below the land and water. You'll hear many governments today in New Zealand say no one owns the water. Well, if that's the case, why did they buy it off us in 1844? It's a legal binding contract. You can find it online. The next one, which is more pertinent to myself, is 1848, the Canterbury Purchase. Um, they offered £2,000. We said, yes, we'll take you £2,000, but you provide us with hospitals, schools, access to our mahinga kai, and sufficient reserves to live on. So in 1848, our tūpuna, our elders, realised that to survive in this new world, we needed health care for our elderly and education for our young persons. Thank you. 
We also needed access to our mahinga kai, all our, our places for that food productions, and sufficient reserves to live on. In, 18, in 1853, they set aside the Māori Reserve 873 in Tuahiwi, that's where I live today. It worked out, by the time seven years, five years post uh, purchase, there was insufficient lands for us to live on. We asked for 100,000 acres, they gave us 2,650 acres. It worked out roughly around 10.4 acres per individual. Just across the track where the European settlement was, it was determined that the Europeans needed a minimum of 50 acres per person to live on. You jump in a car and go 15, mile, 15 minutes north of our reserve and it was 1,000 acres was the minimum. Now I know we're good at producing food in that, but I don't think we're that great that we could survive on 10 acres. The other key point was that in, in 1857, it was set aside in communal practice for communal use. In 1857, we went to the Crown saying some people weren't putting up fences, stock was roaming everywhere, people were developing randomly. The Crown refused to talk to individuals, but they would talk to a collective and they tried to get this collective model through the North Island of New Zealand. Every tribe in the North Island rejected it. They presented it to us, our elders, who, who also rejected it. They went to take that proposal and walk out the door. And they said, Taiho, stop, leave that here with us, come back in three or four weeks' time. In that three or four weeks' time, our elders rewrote that model to suit their own, own purposes for that time. The Crown agents came back four weeks later, they read the proposal and they accepted it. So that was our first engagement at a local level. The land was finally gazetted in 1862, the 1862 Land Amendment Act. Key things from that was that it was to be inalienable, meaning that it couldn't be sold outside of the whānau. We were aliens, so, so it couldn't be sold to inaliens. The other important thing that was that it was for that person, their children, and children to follow. So it was set aside as a permanent place of residence. In 1863, they made an amendment to the Land Amendment Act where they removed the clause inalienable. This meant that Europeans could then go in and buy Māori land. Um, and then we had in 1875, um, they started taxing us for those lands, to live on our own lands which meant that whānau that didn't have money, uh, because we didn't have an economic base at the time, had to lease their land to Europeans to pay for the rents that they couldn't live on because I'd leased it out. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Um, so we'll skip, we'll skip 70 odd years. 1954, the New Zealand economy was in dire straits and as our, as our government always does, they look to the agricultural community to bail them out. <coughs> The farming community said to them at the time, give us cheap land, we can make more money for you. It didn't take the Crown long to look at the map of New Zealand and realise who had the cheapest land, Māori Reserve land. So without any consultation, they changed for all Māori land parcels with four or less owners, they automatically converted it into general title, meaning that parkiers could then buy that land. Within, within 15 years, 25% of Māori titled land that had changed had been sold into European lands. So by 1970s, we had, we had a culture displaced from their own reserves. They talk about 1970s, 1980s, they talk about the urban drift, how the rural community went to the... It wasn't a drift. We were pushed. We were pushed off our lands in the rural and had to go and live in the, in the, in the cities. Um, major myth. Um, and then, 19, on 1980, we, our upoko was elected onto the local council. He put in there, while he was there, he put a special zoning development in the, in the Town Planning Act. It was called, I'm not sure what, but had this real flash title called Rural D Zoning. Um, and all you had to do to build in Tuahiwi was to show your whakapapa or your, gen your blood descent from one of those original land grantees. Um, from that, we probably had about 10, 15 houses sprung up. Um, it's fair to say they weren't the best of quality housing, and today they look quite dilapidated and run down. In 19, 1990, we had the Resource Management Act. 
without any engagement, they took that rural dezoning out of the Act. So then we, we then had to go through the planning process to build on our own lands. At the time, they decided that we were only allowed one house per 10 acres. I remember back in 1853, my great-great-great-grandfather got 14 acres. So come four generations later, and they're telling me that we're only allowed one house per 10 acres. My father's got five siblings. Only one of them got the family land. Only one of them got to live on that land. The other five had to move into Christchurch or Kaiapoi. I have four brothers and sisters. I'm the only one living in the pa. I have four children. Which three cannot live on their lands? I don't want to make that decision. But thankfully, I'm going to skip the Naito settlement act. In 2010, 2011, we had the earthquakes, Christchurch earthquakes. We saw that as an opportunity. Um, our local runanga, through my work, I managed a tribal register at, at Naitahu, and I grabbed my laptop when we had to evacuate. And so I had our whole database of all the addresses, and I was able to tell where everyone in those affected areas were. So we got some funding to ring them. EQC gave us a list of 25 questions to ask them, and we added one more in. If you had the ability, would you consider relocating back to Tuahiwi? Because we didn't get affected by any of the earthquakes. 80% of the respondents said yes. So we took that as the mandate, our Marae trustees, to progress a plan change that would allow whānau to relocate back to Tuahiwi and I'm quite glad to say that and after four years of consultation, it was probably the most consulted plan change under the, uh, in history for New Zealand, we're now allowed to build up to seven houses on one acre. So thankfully, four, my four children get to live on their lands. Kia ora. Thank you, Arapata. Our final speaker is Aldi Alazar from IP2 Indonesia. Um, in 2011, Aldi established the Indonesian uh, regional affiliate of IP2 and has also represented IP2 on the international board um, and is currently secretary of that board. Um, he has led the strategic partnership with the UN and um, looking at providing that beneficial contributions for goal 16 and 17 of the SDGs. Aldi has also been acknowledged and uh, won an award from the Indonesia Development Marketplace competition held by the World Bank Indonesia and for, in a special category for the Corporate Community Village Government Engagement for Sustainable Rural Development Program in East Kuta, Indonesia. Please welcome Aldi. <laughs> Okay, uh, apa kabar? Uh, how are you? Uh, thank you, terima kasih for providing me a valuable space in this uh, uh, conference. Uh, I like to share my uh, experience with IAP2. So in Indonesia, uh, sorry, I, so this is the context uh, why uh, this uh, uh, engagement is important. As you aware that since 2015, so 2000 until 2015, we have Millennium Development Goals, only eight goals, and at that goals, there is no stakeholder engagement and governance uh, clearly stated. And then start from 2000, uh, 2015 until 2020, there is Sustainable Development Goals. And start from there, three years ago, we initiate the conversation with uh, ESCAP and as a member of IEP2 International uh, Board members, we decided to have uh, strategic engagement with the uh, UN, UNS Cup. Why? Because one of uh, IEP2 International vision is to be permanent, permanent organization in the world. And one of our mission is to, be, uh, to advance the practice of IEP2, of a public participation in the world. So, uh, to have a strategic engagement with UNSCAP is we will we also accomplish our vision and missions. And through that, the IP2 International delegate the engagements uh, to IP2 Indonesia and Australia, where me and Lian uh, is a person in charge for that. And thanks to Kylie for also leading this uh, process. 
And a lot of things uh, happen now uh, because of this relationship. Uh, first, like Hitomi said, uh, we have uh, uh, yeah, we have uh, because Fian, our voluntary national report, is one of the momentum, early momentum for uh, SDGs in two years ago. Yeah, so we try to leverage this momentum to apply IP2 uh, foundations. So four countries, uh, because VNR, the report, should, be, should have uh, a quality of engagements in order to develop a, a quality of uh, voluntary nature report. Four pilot projects uh, already there, uh, Kiribati, Sri Lanka, Lao PDRN, I forgot, and Lao. So that's four countries, and then as a result for that, also uh, in that, uh, in the pilot projects, Joel, Michelle, every quality uh, IP2 trainer involved on that uh, produce the training material. So and the train uh, sorry training modules and the training modules uh, were try out in Jakarta last year, yeah, in June or July, uh, and improve uh, as time goes by now, and then. We have also, uh, after the training module, then the development comes to the assessment and planning tools. Uh, because in the uh, 16 and 17, so if you want to understand the 17 goals, one to six is about people. No hunger, no poverty, quality education, quality health, gender. And then from seven to 15 is all about industrializations, city, job creations, Oh, sorry, until 13. And then 14, 15 is about planet, life on Earth and life below Earth. And then 16, 17, to, in order to make 1 to 15 happen, needs to have a governance, 16, and 17 partnership. So that's why 16 and uh, 17 is important. And that's why where IP2 have a good strategic engagements with uh, UNSCAP. So that's the context. That's why start from modeling with the VNR and then have a training modules and then uh, have an assessment and planning tool already in place. And then the next will be the curriculum development. So, and this is what happened with Indonesia because we are one of the member state country. Currently, UNSCAP has uh, 53 member state country, including Indonesia. As soon as uh, our relationship at the global levels, we start conversation with our minister. You may know that Indonesia is uh, not only Bali, yeah, we have five big islands, we have 17,000 islands, we have 75,000 villages. So Bali only small part. <laughs> so, so, so that's, we have a good conversation with five mini, uh, three ministries. Uh, the money, the central bank, uh, Ministry of Administration and Bureaucracy Reformacy, and the National Development Plan Planning Agency. Because they adopt the SDGs, uh, they have a national secretariat, secretariat, they have a policy in place, policy in place, including uh, 16 and uh, 17. With the central bank, uh, they, they, they would like to have uh, additional information about how to, to have uh, a good leaders of a central banks that can engage with other internal and also external. And with uh, Minister of Administration and Reformasi Bureaucracy, uh, they have a regulation uh, on the, all apparatur in Indonesia, they have to have a KPI on uh, consultation, public consultation. So we, we share our contribution to, to strengthen this KPI. So hopefully by next year, we did this, this current new cabinet, the KPI already there, more clear and we will provide with guidance on how to, uh, to have for local apparatus how to make a good uh, public consultations. And with the National Development Planning Agency, we together with ESCAP also, we try to develop uh, 16 and 17. We start with the multi-stakeholder partnership day in 20 November this year, and then we will rolling out uh, in Indonesia. So, this strategic partnership, global, this, our global partnership was really impacting our affiliate, where currently uh, we are, uh, our presence and also uh, our uh, 
present Indonesia is getting there, and also with civil society and others. And then it's time for us to scaling up this uh, valuable best practices lesson learned from 2016, yeah? Uh, scaling up to global level, go back to the International Year of Participation in 2021. Why? Again, this is achieving our vision and mission as a uh, leading and permanent uh, advanced practice of public participation. We hope that, so this is the objective of one, only one year. So we try to utilize, leverage the ecosystem. The, this is the language of UN, United Nations. Mm. So not only Indonesia, but all nations. We try to leverage uh, momentum and also ecosystem of the one year of international uh, of participation in 2021. Why? Because we like to embrace our best practice and lesson learned, our tools, mm -hmm. and also we like to share this to other countries. And uh, slowly but sure, we are in there with hope that please, uh, you have all these things. Please uh, support this uh, year of participation. Uh, we would like to also have a, a good engagement with other countries. So first uh, objective is to, to create awareness for all, all countries in the world. Second, to have an enabling environment of if each countries for these public participations. Like I said, my story in Indonesia, we have policy in place, procedures in place, and KPI for local apparatus. As you may aware that in Indonesia, we have 270 million population, and our local apparatus only currently 4.7 million local apparatus, which ideally 10% from that, which is 27 million. So a lot of works for our government, but uh, that's also opportunity for IP2 to be uh, uh, part of the development. Uh, and the third is we like to mobilize uh, resources for public participation because uh, enabling environment, we have to have a good resources, including uh, human and also financial. That's why this, this year is important. Uh, but last but not least, this is what we have done so far. Uh, this is not important, but uh, last year, oh, this year we have an international forum in Bangkok together with, with ESCAP to understand the, 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 dy the dynamic in Asia Pacific of public participation. And the uh, Lian especially, uh, in, in UN we have three uh, major strategic events. Uh, regionally we have Asia Pacific Forum for Sustainable Development. Second, the high level political forum where last year and this year Lian put significant contribution for that. And then third is uh, UNGA, which is, we are not yet there. Hopefully by next year, that's in September. So I think that's all for from me, and thank you very much. Terima kasih. So thank you to all the speakers. We've now got the opportunity to ask more questions. I'm not sure if we can use the app as well. Um, we also have the. Do I just do I just throw throw this at people? I feel bad about that. <laughs> so this is. Uh, does everyone aware what this is? So you speak into that it's microphone, it's recorded, so um, if anyone has a question, please, yeah. great. Can you please throw it? I feel bad about doing that. <laughs> you can just um, keep the question short. We've only got about 10 minutes, so, and if you want to address a specific panel person, please let us know, otherwise any of the panel can answer. Hi, my question is to anyone on the panel. There's 17 goals, as someone said, they're very interlinked. How important do you think it is that when governments consult on any, or have participation relating to any of those goals, that they brand it as being linked to the sustainable development goals? How much does that matter if people know what they're talking about or engaging about are also sustainable development goals? Okay. Uh, it's a good question and yes it does matter because very often we have consultations and the first question is what are the SDGs, what are we talking about? But um, it's really easy to bring the SDGs down to very local level, we've just heard it done. We've just heard it done because it actually, um, as you can see, it's really comprehensive, it touches almost every aspect of people's lives. 
including issues like subjective wells and the Yeah, and I think it's important just for people to know how the information that they're sharing is going to be used as well. So if you're trying to gather data to um, test anything about against the goals, then kind of letting the community know that this is part of an assessment based on um, this framework, I, I personally feel like it's really important for that to be known to the community and what you're going to do with the information is something that I'm always really proactive about. And. Uh from a Ngāi perspective, we have um, quite a number of engagements or relationships, MOUs, with various government departments. Um, health and education, obviously, as it was in 1848, is still very relevant today. Um, economic growth, development, and other factors that come into it as well. So, yeah, it's it's getting those relationships. I think we're quite blessed through the Tūru Ngāi Act in 1996, where we're treated as treaty partners. So, Crown agencies have to engage through us. You know. Um, I think the critical part, though, from a hapu tribal perspective, is actually owning that data. Yeah. So creating your own data set, owning your own data set, so that you're getting first-hand knowledge rather than second-hand stuff from crown agency. Yeah. Well, my on my well, again, 16 and 17 is important. Uh, uh, one to 14 or 15 cannot for me. It's hard to implement with the quality all the issues because this is interlinked. So public participation and it is all have a discussion in all uh, meetings and con conference. But I think we what we have done so far, we make it walk the talk and talk the walk. We have assessment, we have training model, we have curriculum. So this is very important. Thank you. So other questions in the room? We've got a couple that have come through on the app. Oh, sorry. Yep. Oh, hello. I'd be very grateful if the panel could um, outline the engagement with the banks. Particularly, I'm, I'm interested in Indonesia when you talked about the central bank and taking them on the journey in terms of engagement being critical for sustainable development and, you know, how interested they are. I know from work um, a few years ago, the IFC standards, International Finance Corporation, um, that uh, people that were doing those projects were deeply concerned that the banks were saying, put in your application, you don't have to outline how you're going to engage, that will happen later. So they gave the funding without that essential, uh, I suppose, sign off that engagement was a critical element. So I'm interested in that. Whoever would like to answer, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for that, uh our finance regulation, regulatory body, OJK, is currently have a, like a green finance uh, roadmap for Indonesia uh, since three years ago. So by next year, uh, we, uh, eight banks, eight uh, major big banks in Indonesia, national bank, will uh, adopt and implement this, uh, like a IFC performance standard on our currently World Bank uh, ESF, and from a social framework. And one of the key is about stakeholder engagement. So from three years, means uh, uh, this year, last year, and last couple of years ago, focus only reporting. But next year, start from policy, procedures, everything. So in eight banks, as a pilot, they have to implement these uh, goals because the regulatory body already have a policy and regulation. So this is a must thing to do, and I hope it will work uh, well. And we are in a good discussion on how to make these central banks leaders understand about at least the public participation and stake engagement because they will uh, work with all parties. Thank you. Thanks, Aldi. Um, just if we can go to the app, there's a couple of questions. One for Arapata. What is the Maori way of doing engagement? Uh, so face to face. Um, Again, we're quite fortunate in that Crown agents uh, have to engage with us. Um, the, the best way to engage is right from the be very beginning. I remember sitting in one of the workshops there where time constraints was an issue. Um, we've had engagements where they want a response in two weeks, they want sign on. But a lot of these projects actually started 18 months ago, two years ago. Now, 
these suburbs don't just pop up in two weeks. If you want true engagement, engage at the onset. They're less likely to pick holes in any final document. You go to them in those last two weeks and we get our lawyers to go over every page with fine tooth code. You know, but you get us at the beginning and we'll hold your hands and we'll take you along with it. Yeah. It's, it's around having trust. You know. I think for a lot of agencies, they're very nervous about engaging with Indigenous communities. Um, some are even fearful. Um, so it's really needing to sit alongside them and learn about their history, acknowledge the history, and understand where they're coming from in their decision-making processes. Thank you. There's a question here. I actually, um, I have a final. I have a final comment, so I don't want to impact too much on the wonderful discussion from the panel members, but I did want to remind everyone, if you go to www.yearofengagement.com, there is a form there. We would love everyone who is in attendance, even right now, <laughs> or across the conference, to go there, sign up and show your support for the, U for the call for UN to create the 2021 um, International Year of Participation. Um, all of your support and all of um, your, your details will be going into that final proposal. So as much um, support as we can get would be really great. Sorry to take up time. It's okay, and another question? No, that's it, sorry. Um, just perhaps one final question from the app. I'm just aware that they, we're running out of time. There's going to be other opportunities for discussion. Um, what engagement was involved in the identification of the SDGs? So, uh, okay, so um, the UN established an open working group of stakeholders together with member states. And this met over a period of over a year uh, to identify these 17 goals, first of all. And then they did further work on targets and then indicators. Uh, so just to cut a very long story short, um, this is basically what happened. And there was a very strong advocacy in partnership with civil society, actually, around getting people's views on what the goals should look like. And this advocacy and this consultation went down to the national level. So some countries took notice, some didn't, but there was a, really an unprecedented effort. And this is why the SDG, SDGs are carrying themselves rather than being carried by the UN right now. Leanne, I just wanted to ask if you could hold it up. Yes, I'm going to hold it up. <laughs> All right, good. That's yeah. the, the, the uh, framework and assessment tool. So this probably brings our session to a close. So if we can just thank our panel members.